So I think most of you probably uh, know this. Maybe some of you don't. Um, my daughter and her husband and their one, two, three children, uh, they are in the Middle East uh, where they serve. And uh, we got a chance to go over there and spend some time with them where they are. Uh, this is Grandma Shields. Boy, she's pretty good looking for a grandma. That's what I say. All right. And that's thing one, thing two, and thing three. And she's reading to them there this morning. We love going there. One of the things I get to do when I go there is I get to speak. And I love speaking over there. Um, just uh, It's a real, a real good time uh, for uh, all of us. This time when we went, by the way, they took their vacation. And that meant uh, we think, Mom and Dad, you guys need to be able to relax while you're here. Go on vacation with us. And we found a, a place to go. It's uh, 500 miles away. You'll rent a car, Dad. Whoa, stop. I'm renting a car? Yeah, and you'll drive in this traffic. And I got to tell you, man. We are so spoiled in the United States of America because for the most part, probably nine out of 10 of those cars are not in the same lane that you are. Uh, but uh, in those countries, uh, it's a different world driving. So uh, it was really great though. We had such a good time with them. The message this week, it may sound a little disjointed, it may be incoherent at times because uh, that's me. My laptop is on my lap and I'm writing the sermon right there that you're about to hear. So if it sounds that way, way. Uh, that's why. But man, what a great time that we had. Today, I'm going to talk to you about this concept of commission. It's a word that we've been taking the first letter of and looking at different ideas within it. We talked about how all of us are called. We have a commission. It's unique. It's not the same for you as it is for me. But by golly, you got one. And you want to know what it is. You want to know what it is God has for you to do. It will almost certainly involve an outward focus. You're going to have to look outside of yourself and look out and see what needs to be connected with, what needs to be done. And God has given you what you need in terms of faith to do that. You know, Jesus says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, and he's not saying, go find a mustard seed's worth of faith, that's all you need. He's saying, just use the faith you got. A mustard seed is smaller than a sesame seed on top of your Big Mac. Just use that tiny bit of faith and watch what God does with it. And you're made to make a difference. Um, you're not, your life has meaning because God has intention for it. And you want to live with intentionality. You do not want to be caught in the zeitgeist, in the spirit of the day, and be swept away by the trivialities of our world that we're in now. But you want to be thinking about how can I live a life that's intentional with intentional impact? And then you'll want to be showcasing Christ's service. You'll want to be a servant. And Reverend Sickler did a great job bringing that message, and we're thankful for his ministry here. I just sent him a text when I was in the lobby and said, my people love you, because some of you have talked to me about that. And he wrote back, I'm sure they're glad to have you back. And he was very gracious, but I, I'm thankful for his speaking. And then didn't Chaplain Root, our very own Chaplain Root, didn't he do a great job last week? Yeah, give him that. That's good. Yeah. yeah, showcasing God's teaching. So the, the letter I is the letter we're on now. It's the second of the letter I's. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. But what I really want to do is kind of remind you about this concept of commission. I want to remind you that, that if you have found faith in God, if you have found forgiveness of your sin, if you have experienced a change in your heart that is from God, that isn't by accident. It didn't just happen. It was according to a divine purpose that God was involved in that. And he used individuals just like you, just like me, to make that happen. There were a lot of people probably involved in whatever it took to bring you to faith in Christ. Maybe there was a pastor or a preacher. There was probably maybe a Sunday school teacher or a mom who knew Jesus or a dad who followed God. Children's church workers, teen workers, adult workers. There might have been cooks at a fellowship dinner or at a wild game dinner. There might have been cleaning crews that clean up afterward. There was that one person who actually spoke to you and said, listen, this Jesus, he died for you. And when you turn your heart toward him, and trust in his death on the cross, you find forgiveness, you find life, you find everything that is worth having. If you are a believer, if you've experienced that, it is because someone was living out their commission. Probably a lot of people were living out that which they felt they were called to do. It's an important thing, this commission. 
I'm going to talk about the letter I. Some of you probably know what it stands for because maybe you've looked uh, ahead, but if you don't know what it stands for, I want to just see if you can guess maybe by a story I'm going to tell you. This is an old story. Uh, I found a copy of it in the Globe Gazette uh, from Madison City, Iowa. Uh, the internet's an amazing thing to find such things. It took place in the early 1930s. There was a gentleman named Stanley Capsirk, Caprix, who kind of had a problem. It was a problem that Stanley was familiar with. He'd had it for a good long time. It was his first day of college. He was a freshman at Kent, Chicago Tent, Kent uh, College of Law. And the problem was that Stanley needed to get down the stairs because his class, his first class, was downstairs and Stanley was blind. Now, navigating in a strange place is difficult when you have your sight. Navigating in a strange place is more difficult when you're blind. Navigating a busy staircase in a college building that is full of freshmen trying to run and go and all the, all the excitement that's there, that's even more difficult. Stanley had to get down the stairs. He had to get to his class. There was another freshman named Tom. His name was Tom Overton. And Tom happened to see Stanley. And he walked over to him. He said, hey, do you need a guide to help you get down those steps? Stanley said, that would be great. He said, my name's Tom. My name's Stanley. And so I'm imagining them going down the steps and I see Tom walking in the lead and Stanley just has his hand on his shoulder. And there they go down those steps to the classrooms below. And when they arrive at the door, at the bottom of the steps that is closed, they sit there for a moment and <laughs> Tom said, I got a problem. Stanley, the blind man said, what is your problem? He says, I have no arms. Hmm. Well, I have arms, said Stanley. And he opened a door and they went to class together. Now, over the next few months during that semester at college, the two of them, they became fast friends. Stanley carried the books. Tom guided the way. Stanley took notes in class because Tom could not do that. And then he took those Braille notes and had them printed, transcribed, so that Tom had notes. Tom would read the textbook aloud, the ones that weren't available in Braille. And Stanley would sit and listen and take notes with his Braille machine. They worked hand in hand through the school year. And there at the end of that semester, at the end of that school year rather, Tom earned an honor. It was the highest ranking student in his class. And at the ceremony, they were going to present him with the award. And he spoke up and he insisted, no, 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 no. Half of this award goes to Stanley. And everyone agreed. Commission, C-O-M-M-I-S-S-I-O-N. Can you guess what that second I stands for? It stands for interdependence. Because that story is a story of two men depending on one another. Stanley and Tom embraced interdependence to work toward their law degrees. And I want to, I want to suggest to you that if you're going to live your commission, if your life is going to be marked by an understanding of your call from God and how you live it and how that makes your life meaningful, you're going to have to engage interdependence on a pretty high level, on a pretty high level. If you have your Bibles, I'd ask you to open them to 1 Corinthians 12. There is a Bible app event for this message and you can follow along that way. If you kind of think about this idea of interdependence, you might notice that it really permeates our existence. You see interdependence in business, for example. An architect who's drawing plans for a brick building, he depends on a bricklayer to actually lay the bricks down. But a bricklayer can't lay those bricks down in the right place unless the architect is giving him the good design by which to do it. The two are interdependent, dependent on one another. You see it as well if you happen to own a business and you know there are certain businesses that if they collapse, you're going to have to rethink your model and your business is a business that others depend on not to collapse. Interdependence, 
all around us. I can remember when I was a kid growing up on the farm, I can remember this day. Um, I was on the tractor driving to John Deere, and I don't remember if I was mowing or what I was doing, but I remember I looked over at the cow pasture and I saw the cows over there. And I looked at the, the earth beneath me and the grass in this field and the next field. And I thought, that cow pasture is getting pretty, pretty thin over there. We might need to expand it a little bit because those cows are very dependent upon this grass. And then I looked at the different fields and this grass was very green and lush, but that one wasn't as much. And I know what the difference was. We had a manure spreader and we used it in this field, but we hadn't used it in that field yet. And a thought occurred to me, just as the cattle are dependent upon the grass, the grass are dependent upon that cow manure <laughs> in order to be able to be healthy. Interdependence is everywhere. You see it in your church family as well. This past week, we lost someone from our church, someone whose life demonstrated interdependence. John Peters was an elder emeritus at Kerbinsville Alliance. Let me tell you what that means. An elder is someone who is actively serving as a spiritual leader in the church family. My elders are my right-hand men. I lean hard into them. An elder emeritus is someone who has served well in that capacity and no longer serves as an elder, but emeritus tells us, number one, we honor what he's done in the past, and number two, we're going to use him if we ever need him. He's an elder emeritus. That was John Peters. And John Peters, he gave a lot to Kerwinsville Alliance. As a volunteer, well, that picture of him right there. You can't tell where he is, but I know where he is. He's in the pit that now contains the elevator in the building over there. He's down there with a shovel and with boots on and with wet cement. And do you see the John Peter smile? Do you see that smile? As a volunteer, he helped build that building. As a volunteer, he helped build the building you're in. He gave. He taught children at Kerbinsville Alliance, not regularly, but his wife taught children and she worked as an RN, I think in the ER, I'm not really sure, but I know that she had to work Sundays quite frequently and I'd walk back the hallway sometimes, I'd look into that room and there's John surrounded by a whole bunch of kids with the John Peters smile on his face. He gave us a lot. John was the kind of guy that welcomed new people at Kerbinsville Alliance. Someone mentioned that yesterday at the men's breakfast, that John made them feel welcome immediately when they got here. My son-in-law, when I mentioned, you know, I got the email, I appreciate Dave Clark sent me a text and said, did you see that John Peters passed away? And I went into the kitchen and there we were uh, in the Middle East and I said, you guys aren't going to believe this, but John Peters passed away. And, and my son-in-law, he just kind of looked down for a couple minutes. He's the kind of guy who thinks before he talks. That's a quality I could use probably. Who said amen? I heard that. He kind of looked down for a minute and then he looked up and he said, John Peters was the first person in this church that I knew his name. Because that's the kind of guy he was. He gave a lot. You know, if you do any public speaking, you learn this trick early on. You learn there are certain people to look at and they will give you a sense of, yeah, you're doing a good job. They smile, they nod. There are other people, don't look at them because I don't know what's going on in their life, but buddy, you don't want to look at them, right? For 25 years, John Peters was my face that I looked at every Sunday morning. That warm, reassuring smile was so important to me. He taught to college and career class. My daughter was in that class. John gave. And he served as an elder. The elder is a group of men that I lean hardest upon at Kermansville Alliance. And I can just tell you, John served through some very difficult times. And you could always lean on him. He was always there. Now, if John was here and I began to say those things, he would have stopped me. Because John would say, and I know he would say this, you know, they say, don't ever speak for the dead. You don't know what they would say. I know John would say this because I heard him say it when he was living quite frequently. He would say, I receive far more 
from the people and from God at Kerwinsville Alliance than I could ever hope to give. Do you hear what he's talking about? Interdependence. Interdependence. He depended on his church family. We depended on him. Interdependence is really the biblical model of how church should happen. Look at our passage in chapter 12, verse 12. You read the opening words. It says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. And he's talking about the body, the family of believers. The body of Christ is a, an organism almost that, that has lots of parts and one body. And interdependence happens because we are one because we are united together as one. I know you've heard people say this. I've heard people say this too. I've laughed with people, not at people. I've laughed with people about this reality. Sometimes you feel like, I don't feel any connection with my church family. I just don't, you know, they talk about that connection and I don't feel it, you know, and if you can, if you can respond to that just right, I've done this a few times as a pastor and I'll say, have you given any thought to why do you think that is? And then they'll laugh and they'll say, well, it's probably because I don't spend much time with them, right? You, you've really, if you're going to experience interdependence, you've got to make it a point to be with the people that God is making you one with. And when that happens, it is beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. Overwhelmingly beautiful. I mean, the love and the grace and a sense of peace, the sense of belonging, the hope, the encouragement, the correction, the counsel, the comfort. All those things that we receive from Christ in a church family, when the interdependence tank is full, it is like when you're among your church family, it's like, for crying out loud, it's like Jesus himself is giving me this. It is like Jesus is giving me this. Someone said to me within the past year or so, I can't remember who it was or the circumstances, but they said, you know, when I was with that group of people, I felt like Jesus himself was hugging me. He was. He was. Because he says, we are his hands and feet. We are his body. And it's appropriate to say, yeah, Jesus in the flesh. This is what it feels like to be loved by God. We are the body of Christ. And as we depend on one another, we're depending on him. Verse 13 says that independence, actually, sorry, say that again. Verse 13 says that interdependence actually comes with the package of being a Christ follower. Look at verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given one spirit to drink. I take from that that we are one regardless of our ethnic background, regardless of the kind of music we like, regardless of what, what sports team we cheer for, or if we even like sports, regardless of, of what kind of political persuasion we have, it doesn't really matter because we have been all given the one spirit to drink. And that's the most important thing about us. The most essential thing about us. And we form one body. We are connected. We live our commission. We are dependent on one another because we're one. But, and this seems like the very opposite sentence, it's not, interdependence happens because we're different. We're one, but we're not the same. We are distinct. Verse 14 says, even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many, many different parts. And verse 15 goes on to say, those differences don't prevent interdependence. Look at verse 15. It says, now if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. Hear how they whine when they say that. 
it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Just because you don't serve the same way I serve or the same way John Peters served or the same way a musician serves or the same way someone in the kitchen serves or a children's church worker or, or, or just that guy who has the smile and greets the new person, just because you don't serve in the same way doesn't take away the value of your presence and it doesn't take away your place in the body. The differences, the distinctions don't present a problem. In fact, our differences actually strengthen us. They make us stronger. It's in the very next verse. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an e ear, where would the sense of smell be? <laughs> yeah. We have this idea in our head that different is wrong. It's not. Often, this happens with married couples. In their first few years of marriage, they struggle with these differences. <laughs> getting married. Pastor Steve, getting married, I think it was the biggest mistake we could have made because I don't know any two people that are too different than we are. That's a common refrain. Here's why that happens. When you are looking for someone to date or someone to court or someone to fall in love with, someone to marry. If that person is different, that's intriguing. They're different than your family. They're different than you. They're interesting. And that draws you toward them. And that's a good thing. And, but when you begin and you form a family in a short time, if you're not careful, those differences can become thorns in your flesh. They can actually become conflicts unless you're willing to find value in them. This was the case with Laurel and me, for sure. In the early years of marriage, we would ask this question over and over. Why would God put two people together whose interests, whose abilities, whose perspectives, whose desires, whose outlook differ so dramatically? But somewhere along the way, <laughs> we began to see those differences as a gift from God. What do the French say? Viva la différence. We see those differences as a gift from God. And we actually began to value our differences because they strengthened our ability to make it in this world. They strengthened our ability to care for one another. They strengthened our ability to fulfill our commission, to do what God had in mind for us. Our differences strengthen us because our differences were actually designed by God. They were planned, engineered by him. It's in verse 18. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? So, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. And God designed us to actually need one another. Thinking about the thing, having this thought like, I don't know if I need anybody. That's absolutely absurd. And God shows us it's, it's absurd in verse 21 when he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. That's absurd. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. That's absurd. God made us interdependent and embracing interdependence is so important that God goes on to say, even parts of our body that we might consider to be embarrassing tend to be essential. And Biology 101 taught you that. What that says is, I can't look at a Christian brother or a Christian sister who isn't quite as cool as me, who doesn't really have their act together the way I think they should, who's kind of embarrassing. I can't look at them and say, oh man, I don't need them. Huh. I don't need them. On the contrary, verse 22 says, those parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. Well, the presentable parts need no special treatment. Those differences, they are there by design, placed by God. So this should have you thinking, this should have you kind of getting the point that our differences actually serve to unite us and they make us, they make us more effective than we would be without them. 
Our differences increase our effectiveness by increasing our love for one another. Look at the second part of verse 24. It says, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Man, that's so beautiful. That is so beautiful. No division in the body. It's parts that care for one another equally. And when one of them is suffering, they all suffer with it. And when one of them wins the Super Bowl, is honored, they all rejoice with it. That's interdependence. Who doesn't want that? I mean, who would not want that? It is a necessary ingredient in living out your commission. And the capstone is verse 27. It says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. If you're trusting in Christ, following him, interdependence belongs to you. So I was thinking of my gray matter in my head, this part up here, not my gray hair. (laughs) And I was thinking how it's been declining since I was 12 years old. And I was thinking about, I ought to get something to do that will challenge my brain, that doesn't have something to do with my job, that'll keep my my gray matter working. So I bought the entire collection of the Flintstones. <laughs> amen. amen. I got an amen from Bob. No, I didn't do that. Instead, I downloaded Duolingo. Who knows what Duolingo is? Let me see your hands. Yeah, a bunch of you. Awesome. Awesome. Oh, let's just do this. I, I have 350 some days. How many have at least 350 some days? Put your hand up. 350 days in a row that I have studied Spanish. Okay, good. Sean, how many days you got? 400 and some. 400 and some. Yeah, I'll never catch you if you keep going. Who was back there? Had her hand up. How many days you got, buddy? Uh, what? Wow. That's awesome, right? Who else? Bethany, how many days you got? She's going to just make us all feel miserable about ourselves. How many days you got? Just shy of 1,100 days in a row. Days in a row that she has studied. What are you studying? French. French. Man, why French? She should use Spanish. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So I'm doing it the other day when I was overseas because, man, it's hard when you're on vacation. You don't want to miss one of those days because there just went 350 days, right? So I'm doing it the other day when I'm overseas, and and it's great. The software is well written. They use some of the things that Nintendo uses and Xbox and stuff, because like you want to advance to the next level. You know, I don't know why I want that special icon, but I want it really, really bad, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Right? Yeah. And 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 here's one of the pointers that it popped up to me. Read it. It says, You are five point six times more likely to advance in Duolingo if you do it with a friend. Bethany, I'm going to be honest. It's popped you up a couple times and says, I think you know Bethany. You should be her friend. I don't want to be her friend because I'll just be discouraged when I see how far she is. (laughs) You are 5.6 times more likely to advance in Duolingo if you do it with a friend. Interdependence. Even a computerized Spanish teacher that can't hold a candle to Carrie Tonelli. She's our local Spanish teacher, you know. Even a computerized Spanish teacher knows that interdependence is valuable. It is. People who enjoy interdependence are people who walk deeply in the pathway of interdependence. Sometimes when people talk about interdependence, there's a response that we have. It's a response that goes kind of like this. Ah, you know what? I don't want people depending on me. I got enough people, got enough mouths to feed. I don't need somebody depending on me. Or the response is, you know what? I don't need to depend on anybody. I really, I'm the kind of guy that likes to do it ourselves. And we almost see interdependence as an intrusion or as a problem, something that is foisted upon us. It's not. Look at the screen. Interdependence isn't something you're forced to live with. It is a gift that as a Christ follower, you are blessed to enjoy. It's a beautiful thing, interdependence. And if you want to walk more deeply down this pathway, 
you're going to have to find some courage that will help you to let go of your fear. <laughs> because I've seen fear keep people from embracing interdependence. I've seen the kind of men <laughs> who would brag about being able to stare down a bear. You know those kind of guys? I've seen the kind of men who would brag about being able to stare down a bear shrink from having friendships that involve interdependence. And one of the reasons, they won't admit this, one of the reasons is because of fear. They're afraid. They're kind of afraid they won't know how to respond when someone lays a need on them. Let me just tell you how to respond. Listen. And then quietly think and pray. And then say, how can I help you with that? It's not rocket surgery. See what I did there? I do that all the time. You don't have to be afraid of that kind of thing, afraid of what someone might lay on you. And you don't have to be afraid to, to share what's on your mind with other people. Fear. People who deal with this fear thing that says, I don't really know if I want to have these kind of relationships, they would be wise to kind of take a page from Army Airborne Veteran Sue Weber, who wrote Tender Warrior. Weber's writing about interdependence in this book, The Heart of a Tender Warrior, and he writes these words. Every man, whether he admits it or not, needs a ranger buddy. Remember, he's in the military, he's an airborne ranger. Every man, whether he admits it or not, needs a ranger buddy. Every man needs someone with whom he can face adversity and death. Emerson wrote, we take care of our health, we lay up money, we make our roof tight, we make our clothing sufficient, but who provides wisely that he shall not be wanting in the best property of all? Friends, friends, strong and true. That's a U.S. Army veteran awarded with three bronze stars as an officer and Green Beret in Vietnam. I feel like if Sue Weber isn't afraid to admit and to find ranger buddies, you don't need to be either. Let go of your fear. And second, let go of your pride. Let go of your pride. The first time I went to Israel, we landed, I believe we landed in Tel Aviv, got on the bus. We were all dragging because we'd just been in an airplane for like three days. If you've ever flown over the ocean, you know that's how long it takes. There's some kind of time warp that it doesn't take that long on the earth, but you've been in that plane three days and the people around you have too. Oh, they smell. <laughs> so here we are on this bus and all we want to do is get to the hotel and just get out of our clothes into those sheets and go to sleep. That's all we want to do. And here's this guy, his name's Sheptai. He's our guide, our tour guide. And Sheptai says, I want to talk to you. He's got the microphone. And I'm looking like, what in the world, man? It's dark. What are you going to show us? Let it wait till tomorrow. And he said something. He set us up. He said something so wise. You Americans, he said, you are Americans. You are so humble. I've been to America. I got in an automobile and I drove across your great land. And I came to the body of water that I finally arrived at. And I asked, what is this large expanse of water? I see it goes on endlessly. Endlessly it goes on in both directions. Is this the mighty Pacific Ocean already? And someone said, no, this is not an ocean. This is just a river. This is the Mississippi. <laughs> Who calls? Who calls a flowing ocean a mere river. You Americans, you are so humble. This river that you have here, it, it, makes, it makes our Jordan River seem like the Anderson Creek. Huh. And Nebraska. When I drove through Nebraska and saw your amber waves of grain, they went on and on. Do the math. You could put the whole nation of Israel into the state of Nebraska almost nine times. 
You Americans, you are so humble. And don't get me started about Texas. I have had Texans on a tour, and I know everything is bigger in Texas. <laughs> everything. He set us up. Because then, here's what he said. Listen, if you want to appreciate what you're going to see here in Israel, you're going to have to avoid comparing it to what you have back home. If you're going to appreciate what you're going to see here in Israel, you're going to have to find the humility to acknowledge that what is here is special for entirely different reasons than America is special, maybe even more important reasons. And if you can't humble yourself to do that, you will miss it. Wow, that's wisdom, isn't it? So for the sake of your commission, the one that Christ called you to, humble yourself and learn to depend on others who may have a perspective that you never would have had. Learn to rely on other people who, through their prayer support alone, can carry you through the valley of the shadow of death. Humble yourself and learn to be quiet and listen to what the Spirit of God might say through the body of Christ to you. Humble yourselves and say, maybe what I had in mind to do isn't as important as I thought it was. As, oh, wow. Maybe what I had in mind to do is not as important as I thought it was. Maybe I need to let this person depend on me because that's what God is calling me to do right now. Let go of your pride. And as you walk <laughs> this pathway of interdependence, let go of your tendency to judge others. Don't be all judgy, okay? Show grace, receive grace. So one of my ranger buddies, you know what I mean by that? I'm referring back to the Stu Weber thing. One of my ranger buddies really let me down recently. And frankly, I wanted to walk away from the relationship. I thought, I can't believe he did that. I thought that I could trust him and what he did portrayed me in a very bad light. I don't know why he did that except for some weakness in him and I never would have thought it of him. I would like to just walk away. I can't walk away though. And you know why. If we walk away from everyone who lets us down, that thins the herd, doesn't it? And if everyone that we have let down walked away from us, that would thin it all the more. Moreover, if Jesus walked away from everyone who ever let him down, heaven would be mighty empty. Mighty empty. So I'm giving my ranger buddy grace. I'm not even going to tell him. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit deal with that issue. And I will love him the way I loved him before. I will show him grace. Because grace is essential in all relationships. Grace is essential in interdependence. Grace is a lubricant that makes the gears go and keeps them from seizing. Grace is a cushion that catches you when you fall. Grace is a tie that binds us together. If you want to live your commission, you will do well to nurture a life of interdependence. And if you're going to enter that kind of relationship with mere humans, buddy, you will have to have both pockets filled with grace. Don't worry, though. God's entire being is filled with grace and he overflows it into your life. Being a Christ follower means having a commission, a call to serve God in many ways. That commission is best lived out in a community of believers that we call the family of God. It is a community where people gather together with regularity it is a community where people work together and care for one another. 
It is a community where people unite together around a common mission of making Christ known. It is a community where people disciple one another together. A community where people pray together. A community where people share one another's burdens together. A community where people proclaim the good news of Jesus together. It's a community of interdependence. I want to pray that you and I would embrace it with both hands. So if you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together. Let's bow our hearts, shall we? Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for your great love for us. We are so dependent on you. We are thankful for the commission that you give us that our lives can have meaning for all eternity, not just for the next few days. Thank you for that. We are thankful, Father, for you allowing us to experience interdependence where other individuals depend upon us and we depend upon them. And not only is significant work done in our lives and for the kingdom, Significant pleasure and satisfaction is derived from those relationships. What a good God you are to give us that. There are many things that might prevent us, that might keep us from engaging that interdependence that you have in mind for us. I pray that you will give us the courage to set aside the fear, that we would act in courage and be willing to interact with other believers on a level that is deeper than, than that surface level. I pray, Father, that you would give us the ability, the ability to let go of our pride yes, God. and acknowledge in our hearts that we are not self-sufficient, that we do need others and we have for others something that we might be able to give them Pray in the name of Christ that the spirit of pride that is so prevalent among us would be sent to the place that Jesus would send it. And I pray, Father, I pray that we would see the great grace that you have given us and that we would give that grace to one another. Because when we don't give grace, when we hold grudges, it damages us and it makes our world very small. But when we act in grace, our world is expanded and our relationships are enhanced. And we reflect you. Make us men and women of interdependence for the sake of the commission you have for us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.